Good evening, everyone. How's a, how you doing? I had a, a orchestra director that would always say, start five minutes late and get the anticipation, but I also want to respect everyone's time and um, get everything on the road and start this conversation. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm sorry to shame my boss. Hi, thanks, Ed. <laughs> um, so hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name's Dave Bartos. I'm the coordinator of adult services here at the Cranston Public Library. And I'd just like to welcome you all um, to this evening's program, which is uh, the Freedom to Read, Challenges to Intellectual Freedom, Then and Now. And I'd like to welcome also the audience watching at home through the live stream. Hi. Um, so we are broadcasting live to YouTube. If you want to listen back or watch back to anything, uh, it'll be there for you. Uh, all right. So I will introduce everybody in a moment. I had a few brief announcements. Um, this event is presented in partnership with the Sandra Bornstein Holocaust Education Center. And I'd like to thank uh, Giovanna Weisman for working with me to put this event together. Really appreciate um, your efforts. Thank you. That's a good spot for you. Thank you so much. Um, would love it if everyone could silence their cell phones during the presentation. I'm just listening to my own advice. Um, and the restrooms are right outside the door on the left. Um, so the best way to stay in the loop about all our events, both here and at the Sandra Bornstein Holocaust Edu Education Center, is by signing up for our newsletter. And we've got signups on the table in the back. Um, there's also a pledge from the Freedom Rhode Island Committee, which is an advocacy group that's standing up in the state against book bans and soft censorship. There's also a QR code you can scan to learn more about the group, how you can get involved. There are also cookies back there. So grab a cookie, check out all that other stuff. Um, so this is Banned Books Week. That's an ALA, uh, Unite Against Book Bans event that's just to bring um, awareness to what's going on. And if you haven't noticed, uh, intellectual freedom, um, challenges to intellectual freedom have risen sharply over the past few years. Um, the ALA's Office of Intellectual Freedom released preliminary data for January through August of 2023, and they've documented 695 attempts to censor library materials, with 49% of these challenges happening at public libraries. Um, and there have also been challenges to 1,915 unique titles, which is a 20% increase over the same period last year. Um, and the year in which 2022 is the year that has the highest number of book challenges since ALA began compiling this data 20 years ago. Um, this surge is about more than just the books, though. It's a coordinated effort, a coordinated threat to intellectual freedom that's coming from an activist political movement that seeks to mandate not just what people can read, but who gets to participate fully in our society. So in short, um, I've, I believe that it starts with the books and with libraries, but we can learn from history that it doesn't necessarily stop there. So tonight's panel, our goal is to examine the events of the present in that historical context and to urge everyone here today and watching online to advocate for the libraries that you love and that seek only to stock their shelves with something that will affirm everyone in their community, regardless of race, color, religion, sex, sexual orientation, actual or perceived gender identity or expression, disability, age, national or ethnic origin, or socioeconomic status. Um, so before we invite our panelists up, I'd like to turn the podium over to Michael Goldberg. Um, he's a library trustee with some opening remarks that will further bring together the past with our present. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to librarians in general, and to me in particular, Ed Garja, the director of the Cranston Public Library, Dave Bardos, who you just heard, and uh, to my daughter, Joanna, who found and taught me how to find much of the information that informed my talk. Everyone doing the research needs a librarian. I'm here tonight because of this fuzzy photograph. Among the men posing, I recognize two, my paternal grandfather, Joseph Goldberg, on the far right, and Albert Einstein, just right of center. My grandfather died when I was 18 months old. As a teen, my grandmother told me how special he was, but self-centered teenagers don't care about dead ancestors. When my father died 15 years ago, I found this photograph in his files and started to read to learn more. Joseph served as the administrative director of the Brooklyn Jewish Center from its founding in 1919 till his death in 1954. The BJC, the shul with a pool, was a part of the American movement to replace the tiny village synagogues 
that served as the center of life for Eastern European Jews with a new American model. In April 1934, the Brooklyn Jewish Center Review called for establishing a library in the United States to be housed temporarily at the Brooklyn Jewish Center. A year earlier, the Nazi party in Germany cleansed indecent un-German books from bookstores and public and private libraries, culminating in a mass book burning in Berlin's Opera Square on May 10th, 1933. In response, the burned book library was founded in Paris, inspiring the Brooklyn Jewish Center to open an American library of Nazi banned books. The purpose of such libraries of the band are obvious, the BJC Review editorial stated. They are to preserve in readily accessible collections all books which the Nazis outlawed in Germany. They are to preserve these cultural contributions to the world and at the same time remain monuments both to the men and women who created them and to the barbarity of those who with medieval fanaticism burned them. The center archives include copies of letters my, father, my grandfather wrote to Supreme Court justices, governors, senators, writers, activists, and other notables asking them to join the library advisory board. Through his efforts, Joseph successfully recruited Albert Einstein, Will Durant, Upton Sinclair, Theodore Dreiser, Shalom Ash, and others to advise the creation of the library. The BJC Review estimated books by between 300 and 400 authors were burned in Berlin, although the Nazis never published a list, and authors burned in one place were preserved in others. My grandfather wrote of the difficulty obtaining a list of the purged authors. The BJC worked with the Paris Library and the German Jewish publication Yiddish Rundschau to compile the only list of banned items then available in the United States, a list in demand by libraries, students, and writers. The library opened November 15, 1934, the photo taken at a gala dinner on December 22nd. In his speech at the opening gala, Einstein hailed this establishment of a library which would snatch from oblivion those literary products which were banned only because of their high human qualities. The Brooklyn Public Library archivist reports a small collection at the time of the dinner grew to some 500 titles by the outbreak of World War II. Although mostly forgotten today, the library was a big deal in 1934. Readings arrived from many unable to attend, including Bertrand Russell, Andre Gide, and John Hayes Holmes, a founder of the ACLU. The dinner was widely covered in Brooklyn newspapers. The Jewish Daily Bulletin issued a special edition devoted to the dinner and the library. The ACLU blog, Today in Civil Liberties History, marks the November opening date, noting the library established on this day was one of the relatively few organized anti-Nazi protests in the US. Uh, this may sound like ancient history, but as Dave just mentioned, it's an ongoing issue today. This year, six members of the Rhode Island House of Representatives submitted House Bill H6324 to make the state legislative library, public and charter school libraries criminally liable for distributing indecent material to minors with potential fines and prison terms for librarians. I remembered this picture and at Ed's urging, wrote an essay published in the Cranston Herald and the Warwick Beacon on the 90th anniversary of the Berlin book burning, pleading for the defeat of the bill. House leadership expects the bill won't come out of committee. Still, every week, if not every day, we hear about efforts across the country to ban or restrict access to books through grooming or obscene or whose discussion of this country's history of race relations might upset some students. In the mid 1970s, the Brooklyn Jewish Center closed. The building is now a Hasidic religious school 
And when my other daughter, Sarah, took a tour, the pool was still there. The library, however, is not. Along with the BJC archives, it moved to the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Yet in 1979, someone opened an office safe and found one item by a band author left behind. Albert Einstein's original manuscripts on Unified Field Theory. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you so much for your remarks, Michael. Um, so now I'd like to welcome our panelists up to continue the discussion. So please join me in welcoming Brigitte Hopkins and Bill Lancelotto from the Westerly Library, uh, Stephen Brown, Executive Director of the Rhode Island ACLU, and Michael Bryant, Professor of History and Legal Studies at Bryant University. I love how you all stood up as I said your names. Sorry, that's not in my notes. And then uh, lastly, our moderator, Taylor Cardillo, who is the chair of the Rhode Island Library Association Intellectual Freedom Committee. Thank you. If I'm in the middle, is it going to mess it up? No. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Awesome. Um, so I thought that we would start at the beginning with some definitions so that we all know what we're talking about. So I thought I would present to our panel, um, what is a book ban or challenge and why have we been seeing more coverage of censorship in the news lately? <laughs> um, why don't we start with our library perspective? What is a book ban or challenge? Um, I think it's anything that someone tries to um, stop someone from reading um, or having access to. I think a challenge is starts out verbal um, and then sometimes progresses. I know libraries have put in a lot of steps to um, put in official challenges to materials and some people um, when they ask about a material if we have a discussion with them that usually answers the question but sometimes it doesn't and paperwork needs to be filled out um, and generally you know librarians select books we're trained to select materials for our community members and there is a process. And so when a book is challenged, it often is not considered to be removed because there's already been a process in acquiring that material. Um, but we still go through and review what we've already done um, and we'll, we'll submit our answer. I think banning is actually feeling like it's okay to remove materials from libraries that have already been selected for the primary audience that has been selected for, you know, school libraries. Um, you can jump in here, Bill. <laughs> but, because um, I can ramble on about, <laughs> about this. Um, but really, the, the book banning, I, I'm glad we're not seeing it here. We're seeing a number of challenges, which is really disheartening um, that because libraries don't try to impose their viewpoints upon others. We supply information so people can make their own decisions. And we would never ask a patron to, um, we would never make a decision for a patron about what material is right for them. That's their choice. Um, and I think that we are respectful of even those who do challenge materials, who do want to ban books, because everyone has their own rights to, 
to think what they think? I, I think historically we've had people coming to us and if they challenge a book, it's out of a very uh, honest um, reaction to something that has disturbed them. I think there's been a change in that though. This seems to be an, obviously a, a coordinated political uh, activism on certain groups' parts across the country that are, um, you know, and it's not coming from that honest, um, oh, I don't know if this is appropriate for, you know, a public library or a school, and more about um, silencing certain voices, um, particularly LGBTQ community and um, people of color and their stories and the history that, um, as somebody has already said, might make someone else feel uncomfortable, which is an argument I personally have never understood. I can't remember a single time when I was growing up and learning about the Holocaust or slavery and thinking, oh my God, I, I caused that. That's my fault. So I don't know where that argument actually comes from, but my, my, my <laughs> And uh, Stephen, do you have anything to add from the ACLU's perspective about the increase in coverage about censorship that we're seeing in the news? Um, I, I think we are seeing a lot more, but I think we're seeing a lot more coverage because there's a lot more censorship going on across the country. Uh, I've, uh, you know, the, the ALA, you know, which has been monitoring this, uh, you know, some of the statistics were cited by Dave about how many um, Books are being challenged or banned across the country, and uh, as Bill said, you know, the, unlike I think a lot of times in the past, um, it is a coordinated national campaign um, that has made it such a huge issue and one that we simply cannot ignore at this time. And while it's true that we aren't in Rhode Island dealing with too many of those bans at this point, I'm concerned that it's the challenges are being filed. And to a large extent, the challenges are not necessarily to actually get the books banned, but to create an atmosphere of intimidation um, against librarians, make them think twice before ordering books that might be controversial. And I think that's one of the most dangerous things uh, about what's going on, not just nationally, but also here in Rhode Island. I definitely agree, and uh, I think the, you're talking about the intimidation factor leads to more what we call soft censorship or self-censorship of librarians feeling afraid, especially if they live in more conservative communities, um, hesitating to buy different books and kind of uh, stopping themselves from buying certain books, which is, I think, ultimately a disservice to their community. And it's unfortunate that they feel so intimidated by the current political climate. So um, as has already been alluded to in this presentation, there's a lot that we can learn from history. So uh, Professor Bryan, if you could start off by giving us some background on book banning under the Nazis, who was affected, and how did book banning reflect Nazi ideology and goals? Sure. Can everybody hear me OK? Yeah, okay. I, I think it's helpful uh, in responding to that question to try to place this within an historical context because what the Nazis were involved in, of course, was, uh, was book burning. Um, and book bans and book burning, I think, are very, very close cousins. Uh, book burning typically has to do with a, a public spectacle, with, with uh, carrying out... Um, actual destruction of books in a public forum and doing so in, in a ritualized way in order to draw attention to what's being done. And typically this is motivated by some sort of political, sometimes religious uh, uh, animus, uh, which looks at the books in question as being objectionable. And I'll talk about specific applications of that here in just a moment. But I, I see book burnings as being at least phenomenologically, just in terms of the basic facts of the book burning, they're different than, um, than book bans. Because the book ban oftentimes, and I'll turn to, to our friends from, from the library and from the ACLU here, but from what I can gather, book bans typically take place within a much more uh, furtive, you know, much more secretive sort of environment. 
right? I mean, this is not a public ritual, a public spectacle, but instead, you know, steps are taken to try to remove the books, perhaps in the an under cover of night. I don't know, but certainly to do so in a very uh, um, understated way. There's not you don't find that public spectacle aspect of it that you do with the uh, with book burnings. And yet, I think functionally, the two events. Uh, um, have the same objective, the same goal, which is to choke off people's access to the books, to prevent people from reading the books and being, uh, having access to the, to the ideas expressed in the books. Uh, now, everybody in this room, uh, without a doubt, has uh, uh, heard of Nazi book burnings. So I want to talk for a moment about that. Do I have a little bit of time? I don't want to hog the stage here, but um, this is a complex history. <laughs> And I'd be happy to have other people in the audience perhaps talk about it as well. But um, you know, the Nazis are notorious for book burnings. But the first book burnings, as we've already heard, uh, the first book burnings date back to the, sp to the spring of 1933. And interestingly enough, they were not carried out by the Nazi government. Uh, I'm, I'm, sh I'm chagrined to say, as, as, a, as an educator, a college professor myself, I'm super chagrined to say that it was carried out by students and oftentimes with the, uh, the egging on from their professors, uh, the German Student Association, the Confederation of, I have some, back, some uh, feedback going on. But, uh, you can hear me okay? Um, this is a confederation of university students who announce in April of 1933 that they're going to uh, conduct a nationwide book burning uh, across all of Germany. And um, at the same time, they published their, their 12 theses, as they were called. It was supposed to evoke memories of Luther, Martin Luther, and his, his burning of a papal bowl in 1517 when he posted his 95 theses on the, on the uh, door of the, of the Wittenberg church. And uh, the students were trying to sort of conjure the, uh, the spirit, I think, of, of Luther, who, of course, just burned a single papal bowl. He didn't, he didn't burn all of the papal bowls, but just a single one. But, but nonetheless, this was supposed to evoke the memory of that. And according to the 12 theses, the students were demanding a, um, a purification of German culture and German literature and German language in order to make it fully, fully German, to get rid of, uh, of any, any traces of, of un-German uh, uh, sentiment and to, in particular, to purify it of its, of its Jewish traces. So the students clearly were affected by, by uh, Nazi ideology, even though they were not at the time a government office or an, ex, you know, a, an official extension of the Nazi party. Nonetheless, they very clearly were acting within the spirit of, um, uh, of the Nazis and their, and their ideology. Uh, I, I wanted to mention too, that just a few days before the official book burning, which was supposed to take place on May 10th of 1933, just a few days before in Berlin, there, there was a, an attack orchestrated by the Berlin chapter of the German, of the, uh, German Student Association. This Berlin chapter attacked the Institute for Sex Research um, uh, administered by Magnus Hirschfeld and uh, attacked it and ransacked it, uh, seized the books um, of the Institute for Sex Research and uh, drag them away. They would eventually take them to the, uh, the, the, uh, 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 the Bebelplatz and the, the Staatsoper, the, the, the state opera in downtown uh, Berlin. And on, on May 10th, they would incinerate these books, uh, which were books devoted to transgender issues. Um, the Institute for Sex Research actually did sex reassignment surgery. It was one of the first places to do this. It's, it's rumored that the first uh, transgender woman to have undergone this surgery at the Institute was actually killed in the course of this attack by the German students on, on May 6th. And there are all, all kinds of efforts to try to compare contemporary efforts to ban books to what the Nazis were doing. I'm sometimes very leery of these kinds of comparisons. I, I try to, uh, to keep my powder dry when it comes to, uh, to drawing comparisons between the Nazis and stuff that's going on in our own culture. But I do think that this particular aspect of the Nazi program does resemble efforts to, uh, to attack and to subvert um, information about, about transgender people, LGBTQ uh, persons. I think that there's a direct um, analogy that can be drawn there. Um, so on, on May 10th, then, throughout the country, 
this wave of, of book burnings take place. Well, what kinds of uh, books were, were burned on May 10th of 1933? Uh, really anything that could be construed as being uh, anti-German, um, un-German, undeutsch, right? uh, un-German un books. So we have books written by, by foreigners who uh, supposedly denigrated uh, the new Germany, as the Nazis called it, the Germany of Hitler, uh, books by Romain Roland and H.G. Wells, uh, the literature of Marxism, anything written by Marxists, communists, um, uh, Bolsheviks was subject to being burned. Pacifist literature, the Nazis after the Jews probably hated the pacifists more than anybody else. Just read Mein Kampf sometimes, so much of Mein Kampf is dedicated in addition to diatribes against the Jews to, to fulminations against pacifists. So their literature was burned. Uh, literature that had any kind of liberal or democratic tendency uh, or that defended uh, democracy, and in particular, the Weimar democracy. Anybody who uh, published works trying to defend the Weimar Republic uh, was liable to having those books burned. Um, books that advocated uh, so-called degenerate art, so art that the Nazis disapproved of, uh, you know, the works of Gail Grosch and Otto Dies and the Bauhaus and, and other movements uh, that the Nazis disapproved of were consigned to the fire, writings on sexuality. I just mentioned the attacks on, on Hirschfeld's Institute for Sex Research in Berlin. So any kind of writing that was per perceived as being uh, perverted or not fitting in with the, with the Nazi concept of healthy sexuality, again, would be thrown into the bonfire. And of course, books by Jews. And, and if you were a Jewish author, it didn't matter what you were writing on. The mere fact that, uh, that you wrote a book as a, a Jewish author was enough then for your book for your book to be thrown into into the fire. I want to make one more comment because I've probably talked longer than I should have, but this is such a, a loaded subject and the, and the history here is so important. There were additional book burnings that went on even after the spring of 1933, and I'm going to focus just for a second on on the Eastern territories after the invasion of Poland. We don't oftentimes think of this in the context of book burnings, but in fact. The Nazis, when they move into the East, specifically into Poland, began to seize books in, by, by Poles and for Poles in public libraries as well as in scientific institutes, and they began to destroy those books. It's, it's estimated that some 80% of all public libraries in Poland were destroyed by the Nazis in deliberate acts of vandalism, and some 75% of all scientific libraries were destroyed as well. These were deliberate efforts by the Nazis to destroy Polish culture. And I would argue this was an act of genocide. It was not biological genocide in this case, but was an act of trying to destroy Polish culture by getting rid of their books. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad that you mentioned uh, Hirschfeld and the Institute of Sex Research because I think when people learn about Nazi Germany and the Holocaust, they learn a lot about all of the Jewish culture and Jewish people and Jewish history that we lost. But I think even people within the queer community don't know about the history and the knowledge that we lost when that attack took place. Maybe as many as 20,000 books, some of which were uniquely designed. Well, I think after your statements, the answer to this next question will be pretty clear, but um, I think it's important for us to hit on anyway, which is, and this is a question for all of our panelists. Am I on? Okay, I am up. Um, this is a question for all of our panelists, which is how do the ideas of freedom to read and freedom of expression uphold our democratic ideals? I don't know if we want to go librarians again and then. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be great. Uh, briefly, uh, I'll start. Um, you know, I think a democracy is a premised on an informed citizenry, um, and it's hard to have an informed citizenry if the government is telling you that there are certain ideas that you can't read about. Uh, that you can't think about. Um, it, uh, that is the basic um, uh, underpinning 
of a democratic society to be able to think, speak freely um, without fear. And censorship is precisely the opposite and it, it's anti-democratic to its core. I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, I would just really emphasize uh, how essential access to knowledge, access to ideas, access to, to books is to a democratic culture and specifically to a pluralistic culture. Uh, the oxygen of democracy is the exchange of ideas. I mean, the, the whole concept of, of parliament, of course, we don't have a parliament as such, but we certainly have a parliamentary sort of system, a legislative system, a democratic system. And the, the, the basis to the word parliament is parlay, which is to talk. And so you have to be able to get together and Either, either in person or through literature, through books, you have to be able to exchange ideas so that decisions about policies can be made. And uh, unless we're going to shoot our way to a solution, the only other alternative, it seems to me, is to, to talk our way towards a solution. And you can only have this through the free exchange of, of ideas. Um, to me, it's, uh, it's a, it's, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> It's funny you mentioned uh, people being able to talk to each other, and I don't think it's any real, it would be surprising for everyone in this political climate that a Speaker of the House was just removed because he oh. negotiated with <laughs> another party, which is, you know, to avoid a government shutdown. I think it's, and, you know, it's just so important that everyone have as many options as possible when they go to a library. Yes, you're going to see things you don't like. There are things in my library I don't like. Um, authors who I'm like disgusted by their views and ideas, but I would never ever think of, of depriving someone who wanted to read that material from doing it, deciding that for themselves from doing so. I don't think there's much more to say except that the freedom to read intellectual freedom that's, you know, all libraries and librarians uphold as um, part of, you know, their values um, is, is, I mean, it's, it's the thing that drives us. It's the intellectual freedom is what we consider pretty much in everything that we do you know, from um, programs that we offer, materials that we purchase, um, and and the community that we serve. I mean, it it is it is essential to us and public libraries and democracy. So the idea of trying to squash that, you know, is what what we're seeing today, what we've seen over the decades, and and unfortunately, I think we're seeing it more also because media coverage, you know, is just everywhere, everywhere, and so those ideas are being spread and misinformation is being spread. And I think the role of social media is important too. A lot of these movements are getting organized on social media, uh, on social media, and these lists of hundreds of titles are being shared on social media, so that people who, once it happens in one community, they share this list, and then people who live in another community who agree that those books should not be in the library anymore go to their community and remove those books as well. Um, so the librarians from Westerly uh, recently confronted legislation meant to restrict minors access to certain types of books as proposed by House Rep Samuel Azanaro. <laughs> so Brigitte and Bill, could you two recount the experience of that and why you felt so strongly that you had to per, uh, oppose the potential bill. All right, I get my timeline here. This is gonna be good. It's a good story. Um, uh, I'll get it started and then you can take over when things get really crazy. All right, um, on Wednesday, April 26th, um, we were contacted by Ed Garcia, 
from Stanton Library, who informed me that the primary sponsor of Bill H6324 was a westerly, um, westerly town representative, state representative. Uh, the bill happened to be introduced during the library week, um, which was kind of um, um, ironic. Um, but, and it seemed to be a reaction to another bill that uh, Rhode Island, uh, that the Legislative Action Committee had been supporting. It's, that's H6066, which was attempting to uh, seek protections for librarians, educators, museum workers, uh, uh, seeking to have those protections added to state obscenity laws. Because we are the only state in New England who does not have that written into their obscenity laws. So that's something we had been striving for. And this seemed to be a, a reaction to that. Uh, Ed also asked that uh, if Bourget and I could talk to um, the sponsor of the bill. So on Friday, April 28th, uh, we had a call with the sponsor and he, we expressed all our concerns that the, this was, um, uh, did add, added nothing to the existing bill, we'll only seek to uh, single out certain types of materials and certain uh, professions, for professions for punishment as a way to intimidate them. He was unswayed by anything we said, um, and he replied that he was only doing what his constituents wanted him to do. We replied that we are your constituents because we both live in town and we are strongly opposed to this as well. He just said that we could uh, come up and testify if whatever came out of the meeting. Um, then on Friday, June 2nd, Stephen Brown of the ACLU at Rylanode asked the Westerly Town Council was considering a resolution in support of the bill. Uh, I guess they were looking to try and get this out of committee and thought that having various bodies of government around the state uh, supporting it would, would help. Um, okay, so uh, we immediately began to inform our staff, reach out to our friends groups, uh, community organizations, and the Board of Trustees. Um, do you wanna? So we, we knew we had a lot of supporters already and knew that by contacting certain people, word would spread and spread it did. Um, so our friends group was actually meeting the Monday of our town council meeting and canceled their meeting to come and support us. And it was, it was tremendous. Um, local school librarians, staff, trustees, community members, and even some that attended the meeting for a completely other, another reason, spoke up in opposition of the bill. I believe there were over 20 people who were able to, who got up and spoke. Yeah. So there were 24 in total, 21 in opposition, three for it, and our, the three for it. Um, it was an interesting, very interesting meeting. It is recorded. Um, and there was a particular material that was singled out, and that was gender queer, um, only reconfirming our suspicions behind the bill. Um, but the bill, the amendment to an already existing bill, it added no value. Obs obscene materials are illegal. I mean, they just are. We, we can't buy obscene materials. You can't transport obscene materials. It was just silly to specifically call out, com I think it said comic books and libraries, which libraries don't buy books, librarians do. So um, we, we took great offense to it. Um, but thankfully, even though we don't feel that it even belonged at a town council meeting for them to consider and pass a resolution. Um, it was rejected four to two um, with one counselor abstaining. Unfortunately, it also made it to our school committee agenda, but same result, it was rejected. Um, it, it was 
it was a night where I was very disappointed in some of my, in my representatives, in some community members, but I was also really proud of everyone who came in support of all of our, you know, our colorful community, our varied community. We have, you know, we're westerly, but we are diverse in so many ways. Um, and librarians should really be celebrated for their work and not punished for it. Um, since intellectual freedom is the core value of our profession, basic right in our democratic society, we're always ser we're here to serve the varying interests of every person in our community. Um, and, and opposition to particular materials in libraries and interference with someone's freedom to read, you know, or infringement on anyone's First Amendment rights is something that we will continue to fight for um, as long as we can. And I think hearing about what went on in Westerly just reiterates how important it is for regular everyday people who love their library, who support their library, who love intellectual freedom and the free exchange of ideas to get involved when they hear something going on in their community. And like uh, David said earlier, th at the back table, there is a way that you can find more information about how you can do that. Um, if I could just add one thing. Um, <coughs> I think it is so important to go out and support libraries, especially when they're facing a challenge like this. We only heard about this at the last minute. I think it was trying to fly under the radar, and I'm not sure what would have happened if there hadn't been that public turnout, if we hadn't been, if we hadn't heard about it beforehand and showed up in force, um, it probably could have gone. Maybe that bill would have come out of committee, and maybe it would have gone somewhere on a state level. I don't know, but uh, it was just so important that people came out and just raised a stink. It's really important to raise a stink with stuff like this. Okay. So continuing with the way that legal action can help us fight this trend in, uh, in infringing on people's intellectual freedom rights. Um, Steve, could you describe how the Rhode Island ACLU uh, stands up to these laws and book bans and what the average citizen can do to protect their rights if and when they see one of these challenges in their community? Sure. Uh, well, one of the things that we try to do, and Westerly is a good example, is, is try to keep an eye on what's happening in the community. Um, uh, these often are under the radar, uh, and it really is important to keep on top of efforts to do things, whether it's ban books, adopt resolutions to ban books, uh, or whatever. Um, we were fortunate in that we uh, we learned about this proposed uh, town council resolution, and, and everybody was able to uh, mobilize against it. Um, but I think one of the things that all of you can do is, is just that. Keep an eye on what your city or town council and school committee are doing. Um, agendas need to be posted 48 hours in advance. Uh, they're online. And um, if you take the time to, to take a look at what's coming up, you can find these things that some, some uh, city and town council people are hoping you don't, you don't see. Um, but they're there uh, if you look for them. Uh, and so you know, cer certainly one of our goals is to try to, to get that information out there when we find out about it. Um, we spend time trying to educate individuals about their rights, uh, including students, let them know what their rights are when it comes to censorship. Um, just last night in recognition of Banned Books Week, we, we had an event here in Cranston at the, the William Hall Library where we had authors read from banned books. Um, again, as a way of, uh, I think, sort of, Thumbing our nose at at censors, uh, you know, one of the one of the one of the great things about censorship is how it it creates the forbidden fruit. Um, so often, it only encourages people to to reach out and see what is all this fuss about. I want to read that book, um, and I think that's one of the the positive things that comes out of out of banned books events, events like this. Um, 
Uh, it, it, the way is really celebrating what the First Amendment is all about, notwithstanding all these efforts to, to engage in censorship. Um, obviously, if push came to shove, if there were a, a, uh, a school district uh, that began banning books um, based on their content or controversial nature, um, we are available to, to go into court. Um, one of the, you know, one of the, uh, one of the major cases we would rely on is a case from the early 1980s. It's the only time the United States Supreme Court has ruled on this general issue of schools, a library censorship. Um, and they held that for the most part, schools cannot ban books based solely on their disagreement with the content uh, of the books. Um, the fascinating thing about that decision is, well, there are two fascinating things. One is, it's a good reminder that uh, as bad as it is now, no matter what we're seeing, censorship in the schools has been going on ever since schools have existed. Um, you know, this was a 40, 40 year old case. Um, and you look at some of the books that were banned in this, uh, in this school district, and you'll find them on censored reading lists now. Um, so uh, the beat goes on, but uh, the ACLU is, is around and hopefully uh, prepared to challenge any, any uh, attempt at censorship that actually succeed. Hopefully we don't get there. And if you do what you've just heard about, turn out at school committee meetings, city and town council meetings, and let them know your views, they're going to think twice. It's, it's the best um, barrier to the passage of bad laws, to the um, use of censorship in libraries, either schools or public libraries, by coming out there, letting the people who make decisions know that you aren't going to take it. So uh, many of the books that end up on ALA's most common banned book list are focused on children. So I thought I would pose to the whole panel what it means to give people freedom to read, specifically children, and what is the benefits for them to expo exposing them to a plethora of perspectives through literature. I, I'd like to use a quote that I used when I spoke in front of our Westerly Town Council. Um, so in, in 1990, Dr. Rudine Sim Bishop coined the phrase windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors um, to explain how children see themselves in books and how they can also learn about the lives of others through literature. And when books don't serve as mirrors to children, they learn a powerful lesson about how they are devalued in society. Um, books can also serve as windows that give readers a glimpse into the lives and experiences of others. And they can also serve as sliding glass doors where readers can walk into a story and become part of the world created by the author, immersing themselves in another experience. And this is how our children form their own opinions and get exposed to something outside of their own world. Um, I think it, you know, windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors that is why we, you know, the benefits of exposing children to something outside their world will allow them to grow and become productive members of society because they can have um, empathy for others. And I think it, without that, I don't, I don't have as much hope for the future. I just think, I always go back and think how things were when I was growing up and uh, diverse books, we didn't have them. Uh, we didn't have any sort of representation like that. Uh, maybe one book in a hundred or thousand uh, had any sort of uh, uh, race representation and there was nothing as far as LGBTQ. And I just look around at the collections that public libraries are building now. And to me, it's very, it's very heartening. It, it fills me with joy because there's something for everyone. And, and it just 
reinforces the opinion that we have to make sure that we defend that. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's difficult, I think, to improve on uh, what the librarians are saying. I think you've pretty much captured it. I I would just just add one thing. I you know, we talk about the freedom to read, and uh, as as those of you who may have some legal training know, the fact that you have a right doesn't mean that the government has to provide you with the way to uh, to realize or effectuate that that right. You know, so you have a freedom to read. That doesn't mean the government has to go out and give you books for you to to read. So that the way that this happens, the way that, that young people in particular are able to enjoy this right that they have is through having access, access to a, a robust library that provides them with, with these materials. And I think that the enemies of the free society seem to understand that if you can somehow strike at the library, whether it's a school library or a public library, uh, you can effectively uh, choke off these young people's access to, to alternative points of view that could influence the way in which they see the world. And I, I think this gets then to the issue of the benefits that, that you, had, you had asked about. What are the benefits for young people? They're, they're demonstrable. I mean, the benefit is, is being able to review a lot of different viewpoints and have access to a diverse array of opinions so that you can find your own voice and you can find your own way of thinking about the world and your place in the world. And without the ability to see these alternative points of view, you will be robbed of the opportunity to even find yourself as a young person. I mean, when, when young people are at that age, they're, they're so plastic and they're still developing and they, they need to be able to, uh, to, to ingest these intellectual nutrients so that they can, they can develop a, a strong sense of self. And you can only do that by having access to a, to, to a, uh, to a diverse array of sources, uh, the exact things that are going to be choked off by these these book bans. Uh, the only thing I'd add is it's not only important for young young people being able to find their own voice, it's allowing young people to understand other people's voices. Um, having a diverse collection of books that you read that aren't about you, that don't look like you, um, are really critical, I think, to helping promote empathy um, and understanding among young people as they're growing up uh, because they may live in communities where there aren't a lot of black or Latino people or LGBTQ people who at least are out and reading about it is extremely helpful so you aren't just relying on rumors uh, you know and the things that you know kids talk about in the playground about these things but you're reading real things about real lives that you wouldn't otherwise ever uh, ever reach uh, reach an understanding about. So, um, Professor Bryant, you might have um, some insight on this, but this question is for the whole panel, which is why do we think or suspect that books specifically about the Holocaust frequently get targeted to be removed from schools or to have these challenges or bans happen? Yeah, uh, again, I think you have to look at um, the material that is, uh, is being banned and the one that comes to mind for me, maybe for some of the other folks who are, who are in attendance this evening, is the book by Art Spiegelman, uh, Mouse, uh, which some of you may have, may have read. Um, my understanding is that the objection to Mouse had something to do with, uh, uh, with nudity. True, true story, right? Apparently there were some, some panels of the, for those of you who may not know, but Mouse is a, uh, it's a, it's a graphic novel uh, in which Art Spiegelman conceives of or kind of reconceptualizes the biographies of his, his parents who were Holocaust survivors um, as, and, and sees them as mice. And of course the SS then is, uh, are cats. And he portrays this then as a, uh, as a, as a device for trying to, uh, to understand the Holocaust and the victimization of Jews um, in the 1940s. But this, uh, this apparently was was objectionable to people trying to remove mouse from uh, from library bookshelves because of several panels of naked mice, um, which is inherently absurd on its face. I mean, some of you are laughing and and justifiably so. When I first read it, I thought, my goodness, there are all kinds of things you could object to, maybe about a book, but naked mice. I mean, seriously. 
uh, and the absurdity of it, I think, is quite telling. Because for me, what that reveals is that it's really not about the nudity. Right? It's not about naked mice. What then is it about? And uh, I'm uh, perhaps stepping into um, um, into a potential trap here that I need to be, need to be careful about. Because as I said before, I'm very careful about extending the Nazi analogy to con contemporary circumstances. And I, I, I don't for a moment believe that, that every person who wants to remove a book from a library uh, is, a, is a Nazi or is sympathetic to the ideals of, of Nazism. Not, not at all, not at all. I really think it's important to, to think clearly uh, about what's going on in our country today. There are people of goodwill who, I think they're misguided, but who nonetheless are, uh, have embarked upon these projects. Um, I do, however, think that, that the goal of creating a, um, a purified society, a, maybe a monolithic society in which a single viewpoint or a limited series of viewpoints receive the light of day, I think that does bear certain comparisons with the goal of Nazism, which was to create a folk national state in which a certain point of view and that point of view alone would exist and everything else would be purged away. That's what the students, the German Student Association said. They wanted to purify their society of those un-German elements, which is virtually anything that the Nazis didn't like. And so I, I think that some people who uh, see these themes reflected in, Holo in Holocaust literature, whether it's the diary of Anne Frank, which has also been an object of attempts to uh, at suppression, or Mouse, where it's very much in evidence. If you read the book, you will know of what I'm speaking. I think a lot of people are uncomfortable in seeing that some of their beliefs are reflected uh, in the behavior of the Nazis. And the lengths to which this pernicious ideology can, can go from war and persecution of minorities uh, and, and mass murder and eventually genocide, as, as we all know. Now, uh, again, I'm not suggesting that these people are brown in any way. By brown, I mean National Socialist brown. Uh, what, I, what I am suggesting is that they may see reflected in, uh, in this literature um, perhaps beliefs that they themselves hold, and I think, it's, uh, I think it's embarrassing for them. It's just a theory that I have. I don't know if it's right or not, but I really struggle to understand some of the, uh, the justifications for suppressing Holocaust literature. Are we at time? Okay, I think I'm gonna skip one question then and do a final question. Um, so we talked a lot about, I hate to phrase it as our viewpoint, but we talked a lot about the viewpoint of people who realize how harmful it is to suppress people's freedom to read. Um, but I was wondering if the panel could talk about some common arguments that people who are trying to suppress these ideas have, who are trying to challenge books in schools and libraries, and maybe why they're problematic or misguided. We're only trying to protect the children is a big one. Uh, I'm skeptical that that is really the reason behind it. Uh, let's take gender queer and what happened at our, our meeting in Westerly is the, the person who came and spoke most fervently in favor of the legislation had posters blown up or images taken out of context for that and saying, uh, saying that this was a threat to children um, as if this was going to be something that was going to be on elementary school bookshelves and not something in a high school. Then it's, and he talked a lot about the hypersexualization of children and, and so on. And, but again, they prove the lie when they then say, well, it's not just school libraries that we want this taken out of, it's public libraries too. And then they say, well, it's okay because you can still get it online or in a bookstore. So, um, but again, I, I, I think it's the, 
the material is makes them uncomfortable, and I don't think they want anyone reading it, no matter how old they are. I I think, and and we've heard over and over again, you know, they're trying to protect our children. I think we did have um, a patron come in and even talk about um, a early reader, an easy reader Batman book about why it's- The least violent Batman book ever. Because that's what the world <laughs> functions in. <laughs> and the fact they didn't think it should be on the shelves in our kids' room because the parents get killed. And, and I think, I think some people are afraid to have conversations. You know, I don't think we're doing our children, we're doing them a disservice if we're not having these conversations with them. So then they're, we're, by protecting them, we're, we're putting them in this bubble. And and I, I I think in some ways, and I I try to wrap my head around it and say, okay, these people are really coming from a good place, but you know, we do not ever act in lieu of parents. We do not take on that role. Librarians don't, and it's a parent's responsibility to decide what materials they should or should should read. I have no problem with my children having access to materials because I know that we have those, we can have those discussions and we do. Um, but never should an individual or a group make sweeping decisions that takes away the choice of another reader. And, and I, also, yeah, I'd also like to add that, um, you know, as far as the protecting the children thing, um, it's not like and uh, the books that are challenged, they're not generally part of curricula. They're not anything that the students are being made to read. It's always something that is there if they choose to read it, which is, you know, in no way harmful. Sorry, Gender Queer was actually um, challenged to be removed from the shelves of our high school. And it had never been checked out <laughs> until, <laughs> until the person brought it up <laughs> at a public meeting. And they flew off our shelves, other shelves, the bookstore shelves. Um, so again, to you know, yes, yes. So again, <laughs> yes, um, good book. It is, and and even our librarians, they facilitated a book discussion with a number of um, women um, who just, you know, wanted to learn. They wanted to enlarge their, you know, their world um, by having those conversations. And again having the conversations, they don't hurt anyone. They, you know, let's. Uh, just to, I guess, to make the final point before you move to Q&A, the comments you made about what happened to genderqueer uh, reminds me of one of my favorite anecdotes, and so it goes back to what I was saying earlier about the, the forbidden fruit. Uh, Mark Twain was a great uh, observer of human nature. Um, and his book, uh, Huckleberry Finn, has had its ups and downs over the years from people on all sides of the political spectrum. But uh, I want to read to you a, a letter he wrote to his publisher in 1885. Uh, he said, uh, the Committee of the Public Library of Concord, Massachusetts, have given us a rattling tip-top puff which will go into every paper in the country. They have expelled Huck from their library as, quote, trash and suitable only for the slums, close quote, that will sell 20,000 copies for a sure. So there you have it. And I just, oh, sorry, do you have to well, I, I would just, I, how can I improve on Mark Twain? I mean, my goodness. <laughs> I, I just want to comment. Uh, 
the, the defense about children, right? And again, I, I don't want to suggest that every person who makes this argument is disingenuous, but I think there's a lot of disingenuousness among those who do make this argument. And if you listen to PEN America or the American Library Association, they, they talk about what's going on today, 16% increase in efforts to remove books from uh, from public libraries, not, not just school libraries, but public libraries. And what they're finding is that the same people who were saying originally that they were only interested in the school libraries and protecting the poor little urchins, the poor little children and their delicate ears, that's all they're concerned about. Now they're moving on, now that they've removed books, those books from the school libraries, they're going to the public libraries in order to remove the same books and similar books. You're trying to use the same argument, but ultimately depriving adults also of access to those books. And I think that's the point. It's not so much the kids that they're interested in. I think they want to get rid of these viewpoints altogether and prevent people from having access to them. And I just wanted to add briefly, and, and I think we're kind of skirting around it. I think it is very related to the protecting the children, but I think another common arg argument is that a particular book is pornography. Um, and pornography is something that we have very clear laws about. Um, Steve can probably back me up because my, uh, I'm sure your uh, co uh, constitutional law knowledge and your Supreme Court case knowledge is better than mine. But there is the Miller test. There are things that we have put in place in order to judge what is pornographic and what isn't. And specifically in the Miller test is um, things having literary or artistic value. So just food for thought. <laughs> um, so yeah, do we have time for questions? Does anyone have questions? I come. Oh, yeah. Before you jump in, for our live stream audience, the question was asked, um, the question asker made a point about there being procedures in place for when people want to put into question whether something should be in the library collection, and have we seen books go missing, disappear, be stolen, um, so as a way to try to prevent people from taking them out. Go ahead. Ooh, okay. Uh, um, well, actually, uh, the day of the town council meeting, uh, one of the people in favor of that resolution uh, came into the library and went to the children's room where there were some pride displays um, and checked out a bunch of materials and left a note saying that he would not return those materials until we took down pride displays throughout the library. Um, Eventually, his books were due and he returned them. Um, we had taken down the pride displays because pride month was over. It had nothing to do with his letter, <laughs> but maybe he felt he had a little victory. We didn't really feel like engaging since it would have just, it seemed like he wanted to pick a fight. And so we were just going to ignore him and buy new books. A number of school librarians pulled their funds together and bought us a box of books for our collection. Um, and you know, there there's lots of things that people do. Sometimes I'm not sure if they're actually wanting the books and and a little embarrassed about checking out books. I have seen. Um, people turn the books around so that we can't see their spines. Um, they'll misshelve them. Um, not so much stealing. I also just quickly have a friend that was there that one of the previous libraries I worked at, they were like, our wicked books are always missing. 
So, yeah, whether it was just that people were embarrassed that they wanted books about Wicca, or whether people in the community were upset about Wicca, the Wicca book is always a special place. Do most of his books? Uh, books about the religion of Wicca, which is like, uh, yeah, witchcraft people who believe in spells and magic as part of their religion, rituals, things like that. All right, I saw other hands. Did you have a question? All right, how do I summarize that comment? Um, Steven Pinker, is that his name? Yeah, so uh, in what in his research, he had found that in seems like you said 17th, 18th century, so like Enlightenment period and the rise of the novel being the reason that we saw a decrease in that period of fear of the quote unquote other. Um, all right, are there any more questions? Could, could, I, could I make just a comment? Yeah, it, it's, it's a really interesting point that you're making. And a similar argument has been made that Novel, re novel reading, writing, and reading may have also led to the rise of human rights and uh, people's interest in defending the concept of human rights and the human dignity of people because they of this uh, elicitation of greater compassion for people from foreign cultures or different cultures. So it may actually have, have led, I think of Lynn Hunt in particular has made this argument and some others that uh, novel, novel reading led in that direction as well. Um, so the question was asked about, um, so we talked a lot about books, but also libraries are public spaces where we sometimes allow people to use our space, sometimes for a small fee, sometimes for free. Um, and we don't always have control of what that event is going to be about, what the ideology of the people coming in is about, and basically kind of like how we grapple with being a, a supportive member of the community and not infringing on other people's rights to use the library. I think you can be supportive of the community only if you support free speech for everybody. I, I think it's really that simple. Um, if you start picking and choosing, you are no different than the people who want these, uh, these particular books taken out of the library. Uh, in this instance, the library was open as a public forum. Anybody could make use of it. They did. People who strongly objected, they protested outside the library. They exercised their own free speech. Uh, you know, the ACLU's argument for decades has been the answer to bad speech is more good speech. Um, it's not to su suppress the speech you don't like. Um, you very quickly go down a very bad rabbit hole when you start saying, well, you know, these people are bad to the, you know, are, are promoting these bad ideas to the community. 
the people who want to ban genderqueer feel exactly the same way. Um, so I was very, uh, I was proud of what, how the library reacted to that, let it go on and, and tried to educate the community about why it was important to be neutral and allow the library as, as a neutral public forum. Uh, we had the same group at come to Westerly Library. We had this same issue, um, but you know they they had to be given that opportunity because we do allow our spaces to be used by all. Um, so they were perfectly within their rights to uh, book a room and do their own private event. Um, uh, honestly, we were like. Oh, we, Really, now we have to deal with this <laughs> because we knew there would be negative press. We knew there would be uh, feelings of, you know, why questions about why are you allowing this? Uh, because we have to, because we don't tell people what they can and cannot believe. And it doesn't matter whether or not we approve of those viewpoints, uh, they have as much right to um, use the space as anyone else. And we had a lot of conversations with our staff, not all of whom, um, some of whom were very upset by the viewpoints of that group. But I think eventually, at least most people understood the reason why we allowed it. Could I finish up, Joe? Could it, yeah, I, I, I agree with everything that's being said here. I'm, I'm a John Stuart Mill liberal when it comes to this sort of thing. I'm. The free marketplace of ideas is such that it really has to be untrammeled. And when we start establishing orthodoxy and excluding certain points of view, that's that's the road to perdition, it seems to me. But can I complicate things a little fruitfully? At least I hope it's fruitful. Um, I teach uh, teach German law to uh, graduate and undergraduate undergraduate students. The Germans have a very very different approach to this question because of their experience, their historical experience. They've developed a doctrine under law, maybe some of you are familiar with the fighting democracy idea, Wehrhafte Demokratie in German, the militant democracy. So you probably know, and if you don't, this is an interesting fact, that in Germany, uh, it's illegal to uh, espouse Nazi ideas. And, so, and not just in Germany, also in Canada, so far as I know, Similar laws are in place. Uh, France, I think in most of Western Europe, it is illegal to espouse such ideas. Uh, mein Kampf was illegal. It was illegal to publish Mein Kampf up until 2016, when there was a, uh, an exception made and then the book was finally reissued since the 1940s. And the German perspective, it's interesting. It's not necessarily something that a lot of Americans agree with. And when I teach the subject to American students, they typically don't agree with it. But then we look at some of their case law. I talk about their history, and I talk about why the Germans made this decision in the 1950s to make both communist publications and Nazi publications illegal in Germany. And by the, by the end of the two or three weeks in which we talk about this topic, some of the students are not exactly changed their, have not exactly changed their minds, but they're wavering a little bit. They begin to understand the German point of view that you have to, liberalism has to draw a line at some point and according to this German approach, you cannot allow uh, those who would destroy democratic governance and destroy the very conditions for, for pluralistic government. They cannot be allowed to do that. I mean, Goebbels himself said in 1924, we will use the Weimar Republic's freedoms as a way to destroy the Weimar Republic. And that's exactly what the Nazis did. Does democracy have a role? Does it have some authority? Does it have a justification for perhaps drawing a line at some point and, and declaring that some kinds of speech <clears throat> is so pernicious, so demonstrably harmful that it should not be allowed? Now, I've not made that step myself with my own con concepts of jurisprudence, but I am not unsympathetic to where the Germans stand here. There is an argument that can be made that there are certain types of speech that are so inherently evil and so inflammatory and so destructive and have been proven to be so in history that democracy cannot tolerate it because it, it is an existential threat to the existence of pluralistic society and of democracy itself. So I only mention that as a way to complicate uh, what, what we've been talking about. Uh, well, uh, it's not complicated for me, I'll be honest. Um, 
I mean, I do, I, I do understand, you know, Germany has a history and they're Germany. Uh, we are the United States that has, you know, has had a Bill of Rights <clears throat> from almost its beginning and made the freedom of speech uh, the first among its amendments. Um, but, you know, you mentioned that it was a ban on both Nazism and communism. And we, we tried to deal with communism in the 1950s um, and we know how that worked. So I think there's a, a lesson from our own history uh, about the dangers of giving government, ultimately it's the government that's going to decide what is approved, what is not approved, what is allowed and what is not. And whether you think it's communism, Nazism, gender queer, anything else, we're going to have to rely on the government ultimately to make those decisions. And they may not be the decisions that we end up uh, wanting to see. All right, do we have any more questions? Okay. Thank you all for joining us. It's nice to meet you, Mike Bryant. Yeah, it's a pleasure, it's a pleasure. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm a liberal too, but it's an interesting perspective. It is, it's fascinating. And, and they're still so scarred by the experience even today. You know, I, I spend one month out of the year teaching over there, and it's still where their, their whole legal system is geared around trying to prevent from that event from happening. I understand. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah. I do. And it's just such—it's it, this huge crater in society. It's almost as if a meteor has struck the 